Uh, welcome to Saturday Live, where to be young is very heaven. So let us take you back to your salad days and the customs and habits and obsessions of teenagehood. We talk to someone who knows everything there is to know about Doctor Who and whose Asperger's was diagnosed later in life. It was depicted in, in such a great way. We've got Will Hadcroft with us, um, who was diagnosed as having Asperger's as an mm -hmm. adult, and you were nodding, Will, when uh, when Mark was describing the character of, of Christopher and the sorts of things he mm. experiences. Have you have you read the book at all? I have read the book, What yes. did you think of yeah. it? Uh, I'm, I'm not uh, as um, far up the autistic spectrum as that character Christopher is. I can tell the difference between a smile and a frown, for example. Mm. I don't talk in a monotone voice. But the awkwardness, the, the social interaction problems, um, eye contact problems sometimes, I either don't look at someone often enough or I stare them out. And uh, problems with socialising. Uh, coming here and doing this is easier than going to a party. Because there's fewer people you're having to interact with in front of you. Well, the thing is, this this is, it's not scripted, but it is in my head. You know, I, <laughs> I know what I'm going to be talking about. I know the kind of questions I'm likely to be asked. Mm. In a party environment, you don't. You, I, I can stand talking to two or three people, and they crack a joke, and I crack a joke that I think is in the same vein, and it isn't. Mm. And I only know it isn't when the conversation dies and they just stare at me. You'd enjoy one of my after-dinner speeches. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas Ricky, this, this context for you feels manageable yeah, and something you feel formal. comfortable with. If mm. it's formal, I, I am more at ease. Because you know the rules. Yeah. yeah. I, I've, I've given some talks at, at schools and John Moore's University and places like that and, and put a microphone in front of me and I come to life. Lots more to talk to you about, about your experience, Will. Thank you for the moment, Will Hadcroft and Mark Haddon too. Um, they're both going to be with us until 10.30 today, so if you have any questions or comments for either, get in touch in the normal way. Uh, yes, get in touch, 84844, Saturday Live at bbc.co.uk. You can tweet us at BBC Radio 4 with a hashtag Saturday Live. Uh, lots of you are already, actually, when talking about uh, Asperger's or being on the autistic spectrum, here's one. When referring to empathy and emotion and the autistic spectrum, it's accurate to describe a person as having a difficulty rather than a lack of so many on the spectrum are deeply emotional and the mm. common misconception of being emotionless doesn't allow this to be recognised or understood. The myth of a robotic emotionless being has to be dispelled, says Naomi in Basingstoke. And you, Mark Hadcroft, would agree to that, wouldn't you? Yeah, definitely. The, the idea that you can't empathise at all mm. is, uh, is completely wrong. If you're higher up on the spectrum where, where you are sort of classically autistic, as it were, the sort of Rain Man-type character, then you can't empathise at all, I suppose. But but people on at the thin end of the wedge, like me, who are borderline, um, I, I I do struggle to empathise with with certain things. Uh, I, I, I remember when my stepfather died, for example, and uh, they were bringing his body back from Nigeria, and my mother couldn't couldn't sort of rest with it till the body was back. And I, that baffled me completely at age uh, 17. And I thought, well, it doesn't matter whether his body's in Nigeria or here or anywhere else, he's dead and said as much. <laughs> yes. So that's an example of not being able to empathise. But if someone's crying or they're upset or, or something nice has happened and they're thrilled, you know, I can, I can empathise with those emotions. Well, did those sort of things make you feel different to other children when you were growing up, the way you felt about things? I was aware that I, I, I was different. I, I certainly I felt odd and was made to feel odd by my peers at school. Uh, one or two were, were fine, you know. But uh, when, when for, for most men, for example, the, if you ever meet somebody new, the icebreaker is always football. What team do you support? Uh, did you watch the match last night? Those sort of questions. Now, if you don't support any team and you didn't watch any match and you're not remotely interested and are more, more concerned with what's going on in the TARDIS... <laughs> um, you're a Doctor Who fan. A uh, Doctor Who fan. <laughs> really? Um, then you're immediately frozen out of the conversation. They don't know what to do with you either. So mm. You don't know how to communicate to them because you've killed it stone dead straight away. So you had a passion... But it wasn't football. It was a different passion. Your passion was Doctor Who. Yes. 
And how... Obsessed is the word. Obsessed, really? <laughs> yeah. To my, what extent? So you know everything about it. My mother was driven mad by it. I used to have the theme music on a single record. You talk about the music of the 80s and of your teens, you know. I used to have the Doctor Who theme music on a single record and I'd play it at least once every day. So as soon as my mother heard that, her neck muscles would go all tense <laughs> because she was sick of hearing it. Mm. I also liked uh, Gary Newman, um, who was also on the autistic spectrum, I've since learned. Uh, so you've got that song, Our Friends Electric, that da, 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 mm. da, and she was sick of hearing that. You know, I used to love the da, da. <laughs> Very repetitive beat. Isn't yeah, it? It's, it is monotonous yes. uh, as a rhythm. And you would listen over but and over again. I used again. to key into the da da. I used to like that, the thing that drove everybody else mad. I was drawn to it. And you would listen over and over again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was. I once got into trouble. I was asked to tidy out the garage, and I had a, a live album of Gary Newman called The Skin Mechanic. And there's a, a seven-minute version of Our Friends Electric with a big intro at the beginning, and I played that uh, three times over loud while I was tidying the garage out, and a neighbour complained to my mother that this da-da had gone on for 15 to 20 minutes, you know. How did, but I loved it. How then did your mother, when you say her, her neck used to tighten whenever yeah. she used to hear you doing it again, and that feeling of, oh, here he goes again, why don't you stop with a Gary Newman and the Doctor yeah. Who? Yeah. What, how did you respond to that? Were you able to tell her what was going on in your head and, and why it felt I comfortable kind of, and safe? I kind of used it as an escapism sort of thing. So it annoyed me. Looking back, now, I, I, I can empathise with her being like that. But at the time, I, mean, she, I remember she once said to me, you've mentioned Doctor Who three times in 30 minutes. And I thought, and? <laughs> you, know, you know, so what? You know, people... The problem I had was that uh, what we call neurotypical people that's the word that people on the autistic spectrum use for, for people who are not. Yes, Modern. yes. They, um, they have their obsessions too, but because they're widely accepted, no one's bothered. If someone talks yes. about yes. football incessantly, they just go, he's football crazy, that, that guy. No one says he's obsessed with it. Or, or it's, it's, it's becoming not seen extreme. As a negative. It's not, no. Mm. It seems like it's almost everything you've said, I can find an example in my own life which would mm. kind of go along with that obsessional behaviour. I had mm. this thing when I was young about having, I didn't just take a teddy to bed, I took about 15 different things to bed, including a giant ball bearing and a cowrie shell. Yeah. And I had to have those things with me, and if they weren't with me, I felt terribly out of sorts. But I, yeah. that was a sign of any, or an indicator of anything, uh, no diagnosis came my way, but I can recognise the behaviour. It, it, one, of the, one of the things that sort of makes it more obviously Aspergic, I suppose, is that it doesn't stop. So most people grow out of it, that term in inverted commas. Uh, I get, so, you know, you, you know, I talk about the old Doctor Who compared to the current Doctor Who, and people will, will say, well, you feel like that because you're 43. And I'm thinking, no, no, I still love the old Doctor Who a lot, you know, and think about it every day. Uh, so that sort of obsessive thing has not gone. It, and the degree of it hasn't gone, really. You know, the, the same sort of level of intensity. I've just learned to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> I was in Doctor Who, by the way. I know. Oh, you know what? I'm talking to a doctor. Okay, which episode? Uh, the Wedding of River Song, I think. Excellent. That's exactly it. There were three newsreaders in that episode. I don't remember the other two. So there we there are. Must be something Meredith about Vieira, go. Well <laughs> done, and and Bill Turnbull. Um, when you were diagnosed, because as you were growing up, there was no Asperger's condition which was identified. I mean, it no. was in other parts of the world, but here in the UK, the word Asperger's wasn't really properly understood until the 1990s. No, 94, I think it was when it was acknowledged that mm. it really exists. Psychologists wouldn't have it for a long time that autism was this broad, very broad spectrum. It was just autism. So, uh, But then I didn't get a diagnosis for, for a good 10 years after that. I, um, I went to see a psychologist in 1995 and they put it all down to childhood trauma and various sort of physical things. When I, I said to them, what, well, what is it then? They said it isn't anything. You know, it's, it's yeah. just a series of events that have led you to feel like this. And I knew then they were wrong. But how could I say you're wrong to a psychologist? You'd watched a documentary on television as well, hadn't you? And, and it hadn't was that yeah, 2003, something? ten years ago, was 
when it all started for me, I, actually the first thing was I read an article in Doctor Who magazine, of all things. Oh, really? There was a journalist called Gary Gillett who wrote for them at that time, and he wrote this thing called The Fan Gene. Mm. And he said that an actress at a Doctor Who convention at the bar said to him, I think you're all a little bit autistic. And that set him uh, researching it, and he found Asperger's, and then he related some of the traits to himself and said, she's got a point. And as I'm reading the article, I'm thinking, yeah, she has. And then uh, a few weeks later, I was reading online that Gary Newman has sort of identified himself with Asperger's. His wife, uh, her brother, has been diagnosed with it, and now she knows the diagnostic criteria. She said, I think you've got it, Gary. And when you look at the lyrics to We Are Glass and Our Friends Electric and Cars and those early hits, they are all about feeling isolated and awkward and alienated, which is why I'm drawn to them. So he didn't know he had Asperger's then, and I didn't either about me at the time, but I was drawn to the lyrics. And then a few months after that, I think it was all in the same year, I saw on BBC Two, My Family and Autism presented by a young boy, 14-year-old he was then, called Luke Jackson. And he actually presented the programme and said he felt like an alien that had fallen to earth from somewhere. Uh, his obsession was with computers. and He drove his mother mad with computers, talking mm. about computer programming all the time. So when my wife was sat watching it with me. She said, it's like a 14-year-old you. Yeah. And then, uh, and then um, he'd written a book called Freaks, Geeks and Asperger's Syndrome. So I bought that, uh, identify with that. Then I bought Tony, Dr. Tony Atwood's book, He's the World Expert. Um, and then I pitched my own autobiography to that publisher, uh, The Feelings Unmutual, and they accepted <laughs> the it. Feelings <laughs> Unmutual. And, and then you went back to a psychologist or you went to a psychologist and, and asked for a proper diagnosis, presumably, well, did well, you? Well, what I had to do was, because um, in my day job I work in an office, and they, they demanded I have a diagnosis. Things right. were going wrong at work. And I said, well, it's because of Asperger's. And they said, but I, HR don't acknowledge you've got it until you have a diagnosis. So you have to go out and make so sure you get the diagnosis. They actually set me up with a psychologist themselves. And right. I went there armed with my book. Mm. And um, that my book's quoted in Dr. Atwood's new book three times. And I said, look, this, this guy sees I've got it and he's never met me. Can so I ask you? Well, I was then diagnosed on that basis. Yeah, sorry, to Can I ask you how helpful it it is or it was to be diagnosed with having Asperger's syndrome? It's it was it is important. Uh, I, mean, I was talking to to Mark Haddon earlier about uh, labels, and it wouldn't be nice to get rid of all the labels. But mm. I used to think that, but now I've got the diagnosis. I find that it's a help. It doesn't help me. I find that neurotypical people need a definition. I don't need a definition, I'm just me. But other people need to, to be able to define it before they can help you. People who before. aren't on the autistic spectrum need to know. They won't make allowances. But if you say, I've got Asperger's syndrome and the diagnostic criteria is this, 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 and this is how it affects me, immediately they go, oh, we understand now. So I used to, I used to not want a label. But now I'm glad I've got it because it helps me get through life easier. Mm. It's easier now than it was before I had that. And allows you perhaps better to challenge any stereotypes or caricatures that people carry around in their heads because they mm. perhaps have an expectation of you that you can then confound. Yeah. Well, you, you get told to your face that you haven't got it because you can make eye contact and you don't talk in a monotone voice. Um, but, you know, if I, I, there's no doubt that I've got it. I, I went to... Uh, a wedding, for example, a wedding reception a few months back. I got all dressed up, my wife, and we went to the wedding, and as soon as I got to the door and I saw everybody and heard the music and someone came up to me and said, do you want a drink? I just completely seized up in a fit of anxiety and panic. Sounds and, like a vocation to the priesthood. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just said to my wife, I can't do it, and I went home, and I abandoned her there. Mm. And then I go home and I sit there feeling worthless and, and then it, it cascades then into depression and mm. quite a dark area. And I'm wondering, is that because what, what f defeats you is a sense of the kind of sheer mass and accumulation of social encounters mm. and uh, kind of codes you're going to have to crack and, and, and it just, it's, yeah. the, it's the weight of it, the mass and of it. sensory overload, that's the phrase yeah. Dr Atwood uses, that yeah. you're trying, your brain is not filtering out the sounds... 
So you're listening to people's conversations that have nothing to do with you. You can see all the lights, you can hear the music, and it's just all too much. Yes. And your brain just shuts down, it can't cope, can't filter it out. Which is very much what you see in Mark Haddon's book, mm. um, who's, who's with us for the rest of the programme, who wrote Curious Incident to the Dog in the Nighttime, and is, is now on stage. But when you first wrote that book... Mark, on, on the front cover, I, I seem to remember it said Asperger's, a boy with Asperger's. Yes, I didn't write the cover. And ah. I slightly regret that in retrospect. <clears throat> I mean, when I started, I had no thought of Asperger's disability, any of that at all. In fact, I, I started with this image of a dog with a fork through it, and I, for some reason I thought it was, it was quite hilarious. <laughs> and, um, but I realised it was only hilarious if you, if you described it in a really, really flat voice. You know, the, you know the Paul Merton principle where mm. as long as you don't think you're funny, you're much funnier? Mm. So I wrote, I wrote it describing it in that voice, and then I thought what kind of person might have this voice? And Christopher kind of just came along afterwards. And I think if the book worked, it worked because of that, because it wasn't front-loaded with some idea about what I wanted to say. I just wanted to make that voice come alive. And um, and that was that was all I cared about, really. The, the label got kind of nailed onto it um, afterwards. Mm. Well, Will Haddon and... Uh, well, do you know, I've been messing up your names <laughs> from the, the start of the, the programme. It is, isn't it? They're very close. They're very it? close. Yeah. Thank you very much for giving me an excuse. That's very generous you're, you're of you, Will. <laughs> <laughs> Will Hadcroft, Mark Haddon are going to be with us until 10.30 this morning. Lots of you writing in with questions and uh, we'll put them to them a little bit later.